three. Welcome! Yeah. Welcome to Northview Community Church. It's Sunday, October 18th. For okay. God so loved the earth that he gave his one and only son that whoever and now believes I in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him that was john 3 16 and 17 chosen by ren did you want to say anything yes i love uh, the only person on on the whole entire earth is my mom and dad and and ren and Rosie and my kitties. <laughs> have, have a great week, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, Northview. Please join me as we enter into worship with music. Thank you, Abbott family, and thank you, Jeremy, for leading us into worship together. Let's continue to worship as we pray now. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for the community that is both scattered and gathered. We certainly miss each other, and we are looking forward to next week when at least some of us will be able to gather together in this building. We long for one another, and that's a really good thing. This morning, Lord, we pray that you would gather our hearts, gather us together in your spirit, so that we might worship together with all of heaven 
in adoration of you, the one who sits on the throne and of the lamb who was slain. We are grateful for all that you have done and all that you have provided for us. Everything is a good gift that comes from you. So we bless your name this morning, Lord, and we pray that you would receive our worship as worthy and acceptable to you. Lord, we, in that same vein, desire to give of our tithes and our offerings, recognizing that we give back a portion of what it is that you have given to us. So, Lord, we pray that you would move and that you would make us joyful and cheerful givers of the good gifts that you have given to us, Lord. May our gratitude be overflowing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friends, as we have just prayed, we want to give you an opportunity to worship in this way in the giving of your tithes and your offerings. And on your screen is a slide which has all the various options of giving that you could be using here at Northview. You can go to our website to the giving page online there, or you can download and use the Tithely app. We have an e-transfer option. Just send an email to giving at northview.sk.ca or you can fill out the pre-authorized debit form. You can always mail in a check or you can contact the church office and we can arrange to pick up a cash donation. So again, we just want to stress how grateful we are to you at this time for your faithful giving the way that has enabled us to meet our ministry commitments for this year, to care for each other as a community, as well as to express concern and the love of Christ to those in our neighborhoods. So thank you. We really do appreciate that. We have a few announcements, and our first announcement is again an announcement just um, talking about how things are going to function next week when we open. So here's me. <laughs> Hi Northview, Pastor David here. I am really excited to announce that we are reopening for in-person worship on Sunday, October the 25th at 10.30 a.m., our regular service time. And we are so excited and can't wait to see you in person. There's some stuff that you need to know. Uh, so prior to the service, what we need you to do is to register. Um, we can only have 85 people at a time come into the church. That includes anybody who's leading. So we need you to go to our Northview website, northview.sk.ca, and pre-register during the week leading up to that service and every week that you are going to be attending after that. Um, we are going to have 75 pre-registration uh, spots open and we want to leave 10 open for people within our community who might walk in and hadn't had time to pre-register. Also, if you're not comfortable uh, using the internet to register, you can call the church office and we will get you registered that way. So just give us a call here at the church and we'll get you set up. Don't worry. Uh, when you come, you arrive at 15, that's when our doors will open. And, um, and then when you uh, come in, we would ask that you would be wearing your mask as you come in. Masks are mandatory and they should be kept on throughout the entire time that you're here until you exit from the building again. You'll notice when you get here that the doors are marked both enter and exit only. We would ask you that you would obey those signs, that you would only come through the door to enter through the entrance door and that you would exit the building through the exit uh, door. And that's both on the, the doors to the outside and the doors to the sanctuary. That just helps us with having a, a um, flow of movement that avoids people coming into contact with each other. And then at the service, what you need to know. So when you arrive at the church and you're wearing your mask, we ask that you come in, uh, get some hand sanitizer and sanitize those hands and just check in at our table in the foyer. Um, and because you pre-registered, it should be a matter of just ticking a box. And then you can follow the green tape that's on the floor into the sanctuary and you can pick a seat. You'll notice that there are some different groupings of the chairs. Some are on the walls are grouped in seven and the ones in the middle are grouped in four. 
we would ask you that you would pick um, seating that matches your group. Um, so if you were a couple, two people, we would get you to take one of the sections that has four. If you're a family of six, we would have you take one of the sections that has seven, uh, and so on. So you can figure that out. And then uh, what we ask is that you stay in your seat um, throughout the whole service. So we are not at a place where we can start visiting with each other. We need to maintain the social distance. And part of the way we have the um, sanctuary set up is to maintain the social distance. We also um, have taken out the hangers out of the foyer. So you'll need to keep your, your jacket or your coat with you. Basically, keep your stuff with you at your seat. And then once the service is over, uh, we would ask you to uh, follow the green tape uh, all the way around until it becomes a blue tape. And the blue tape is the tape that will take you towards the exit. So you can follow the blue tape out of the exit door and um, you can exit through there. Uh, again, because we want to limit contact of things, we won't be taking up an offering. We will continue to have an offering segment in our worship service, but we continue to, um, to ask you to be giving through one of our online options like Tithely or through the e-transfer or the pre-authorized debit. But Again, if you are just not comfortable with those options, we do have a box set up by the exit door for you to drop in your cash or your check if that's something that you prefer to do. So you can still give in that way. We ask that when the service is over that you do leave promptly from the building. Again, we want to limit any um, social interaction. Um, and so once you're out of the building, if you want to have appropriately spaced conversations, you're more than welcome to do that. A couple of other things that you should know about our service. We are aiming to have only a 45 minute uh, service. So it is going to follow the same structure as what we've been doing online. Uh, just two songs, an opening song and a closing song, limited announcements, um, a shorter uh, sermon. And, um, and so we're hoping that one that that reduces the length of time that we're um, sitting together in the space, but also to make it easier on kids because we do want to be kid friendly. We are not doing Sunday school. That's just too complex in, in light of COVID. But um, Carla and Sarah, our Discovery Land leaders, have put together activity packages for the kids. And Sarah and Carla will tell you more about that as you come. Uh, so we do have some activities for your kids. Um, two last things that we want to stress is um, we would ask that you would use the washroom before you come and after you leave rather than uh, planning to use the washroom while you're here at the service. Again, that's one of the reasons why we're having a shorter service. If you do uh, need to use the washroom, we would... Um, we want to keep it limited one per person. And you'll see that there are sinks and um, stalls that are closed off um, to limit the amount of contact that is happening. And you'll see some washroom protocols uh, posted about what to do um, when you go to the washroom, how to um, clean after you're done. And lastly, uh, we won't be providing any uh, coffee or tea. And we're asking that you don't bring any water, coffee, or tea yourself. Again, that would just limit the moving of the mask up and down. We want to keep people safe, and so we're asking you to keep mask on. Have a coffee before you come. Have something to drink after you go. So that's it. October the 25th, 10.30 a.m. We are so excited to be together. It's going to be so good. Thanks, and have a great day. And one last thing. If you're sick at all, if you have any symptoms, we are going to ask you to just stay home and, and participate in the service online. We just want to be super careful that we are not spreading anything. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon. Well, um, like I said in the video, we are really looking forward to when we can be together and looking forward uh, more so to when things get back to more of a normal when we can actually greet each other and, and do a fuller service together. But we takes what we can get. Uh, two other announcements. 
Uh, same as last week. One is um, we need board nominations as the year's running out. And, um, and so we are looking to fill one board position. So uh, this year is a little different. Normally we have a paper ballot that we would provide you, ask you to fill it out, and then put it into a, a box. Um, this year, because of COVID, we're asking you to just um, email Bev Graham directly in her emails in the bulletin um, with, your, um, with your nomination. And so if you could be prayerfully considering um, that nomination, that would be wonderful. And we thank you for that. Our second announcement is that um, the Free Methodist Church in Canada Uh, we want to invite you, particularly if you are in leadership here at Northview, if you're on the board, if you're on the staff, or if you are part of the leadership group, or have an interest in leadership at Northview, um, that you would uh, let us know through the church office that you would like to participate in that free um, retreat. It's over two days, next Saturday and next Sunday, from two to four. And um, it is basically a collection of videos and discussion, and um, you will benefit from it. And so we would invite you to, um, to consider participating in that and letting us know. Well, here now is Sarah with our Discovery Land moment. Today's... Good morning. My name's Sarah, and this is our weekly children's time. You can find a link to the weekly video and the discussion questions on Northview's website. Well, today's story is about God speaking to Abram again. And I love this story. I've loved this story since I was a little girl and in Sunday school. And in a minute, you'll find out why. Well, God was speaking to Abram and he told him something interesting. He said, I'm going to change your name. You're not going to be Abram anymore. You're going to be Abraham. And he changed his name. And he also changed Abraham's wife's name. Her name was Sarai, and he changed her name to Sarah. You can imagine that when I was in Sunday school, I thought it was pretty cool that my name was in the Bible, and that's why I really love this story. Well, this came from the book of Genesis, from chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, uh, and uh, verses 15 through 22, as well as chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. And in this story, God tells Abraham something amazing. He says, even though you and your wife are really old, even older than grandmas and grandpas, you're going to have a baby. And that was something they had wanted for a long time. And even though it was hard to believe, they trusted in God. And, and that's what God did for them. He gave them a baby. Well, the big idea this week is we can trust God even when it seems ridiculous. And I think if you think about a grandma and a grandpa having a baby, you might think that's really ridiculous, but not too ridiculous for God. All right. It's time for the key verse. I'm going to hold my paper so I can see it, and we're going to say it together. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. All nations on earth will be blessed because of you. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. So this week, I want you to remember three things. One, we can know God's heart by growing with him. And we do that by learning about him through his word and th with our parents and at Sunday school. We can trust God in any situation. Nothing is too big for God. And he's always there for us. And that God wants the best for us. He wants the best for his children that he loves very much. So have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye. Today's scripture reading has two passages. The first passage is from Genesis 4 verses 2 to 5. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. 
The second passage is from Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just going to make sure that I'm on. Yep. Okay. Um, I have been a part of churches for a long time now. And the older I get, it seems the longer that I've been a part of churches for. During that time, I have heard a lot of sermons around the, the issue of giving or around the subject of giving. And I have to be honest with you, I have disliked most of them. Well, mainly that's had to do with um, the fact that these sermons were born out of things happening in the church. So one of my churches, they were wanting to expand the, the sanctuary, expand their space. And so they started to do a capital fundraising in order to make the building a bigger building. And it just seemed that uh, that was leading up to the millennium. Between uh, the millennium, we're all going to be raptured out of here sermons and the world's going to burn. And then sermons around, you need to give more money, you need to give more money because we've got to build this bigger space. Um, I was fairly turned off. I've been a part of churches where there has been financial crisis. Um, giving is not keeping up with the ministry expenses. Um, and in some ways, um, we, we will say that uh, the members vote with their wallets and with their feet. And so I've been a part of churches where things have not been great. And as a result, um, the giving was down. And so you have those kinds of sermons that call people to give and to give because there's something happening in the life of the community that requires it. And then if that money doesn't come in fast enough or is enough to cover what it is that they need to cover, then there's more sermons that become more desperate and sound the alarm stronger and lay on guilt on you, which, of course, you can imagine is not a lot of fun for the person sitting in the pew listening. Now, a big part of that, when I say guilt, also was born out of the fact that for most of uh, my life, I didn't have enough that I felt like I could give or I could give generously or I could give freely. Now, despite my own earlier experiences with this type of sermon, we are today launching into a sermon series on giving. My hope is that the tone of this series is going to be different than what I have experienced in the past and maybe what you have experienced in the past too. Happily, we are not uh, in need of raising money to build a new building or expand this building. Uh, and we are not in a financial crisis. In fact, due to God's provision and your faithfulness of giving, we're actually ahead this year, um, which is just an amazing thing in light of the COVID reality. So we want to, again, give praise and glory to God for meeting our needs. And again, thank you for your faithful giving here at Northview. So if we're not in trouble, then why are we having a series on giving? Well, one of the things that really stuck with me as I listened to those sermons, and like, they're not bad sermons, they're good sermons, um, was that the reality is Jesus spoke more about money than he talked about heaven and hell. Let me say that again. Jesus talked more about money than he talked about heaven or hell. And what that means for us is that this is a topic that we cannot ignore. If we care about discipleship, and we do here at Northview, it's one of our core values, we've just spent the last year talking about discipleship, then the reality is that we have to think about giving as a part of our life of obedience. Now, let me just start off by sharing with you that um, I remember the fear around giving. Like I said, 
for most of my life growing up with low income, um, and I didn't have a job, I didn't have a lot of access to money as a kid, uh, and the little money that I did get, I wanted to spend on the things I wanted. And then as we got married and started a family, um, we were living check to check. And so often it felt like I didn't have uh, very much to give. But as we got older and as we progressed, there were more opportunities. I remember um, we came into some money after selling a house and... Um, I was starting to work in fundraising, and we had been thinking about in fundraising the principles of generosity and giving from a biblical standpoint. And so Sarah and I had a conversation about how we are going to give a portion of that money back to God through a couple of different places, through our church and through an organization that we supported. And I remember having that conversation and just how tight my chest felt I was gripped with fear at the idea, even though there was a, a big sum of money, of giving some of that away. And all I could think was there was going to be less uh, for what it is that I want or I need. So I recognize that um, fear is a big part of money in our day-to-day -day lives. And so what I want to do with this um, is one I want to just assure you, we're not in crisis and this isn't about making you feel guilty or calling you to give us more of your money. Um, this is really about you. The second thing we're going to do is rather than having five or six uh, sermons all in a row on the same topic, um, I've decided to spread this out over the year. So this uh, sermon series on faith and finance is going to be peppered throughout our ministry year. So you've got a, a slide on your screen there that just shows you the breakdown. And basically, we're going to have one here in October, the next one in January, then in April, then one in June, and Sandy Crozer is going to finish up for us in August. So my hope is by doing that, that we will benefit from hearing what the Bible says um, about giving, because that really is about our life of discipleship, our, our life of becoming like Jesus, but without the heavy feeling that can come when we have these kinds of a series. I don't want you to feel bombarded. I, I want this to really be almost a sense of oasis for us as we move through the year. So again, let me just say this one more time really clearly. This is not about Northview trying to get more money from you. This is about you and me growing into the image of Christ. This is about us becoming like Christ who was obedient, giving up everything right down to his life in, a, in an obedience and a worship of God the Father. We want to be like that as well. So let's talk about the idea of giving and think about it from a biblical point of view and perspective. Really appreciate Chris's reading um, of Genesis 4, 2 to 5, particularly because um, similar to the misprint in the bulletin, I gave him the wrong passage initially. So he had to do that scripture reading twice for me. So we have this scene, Cain and Abel. The two sons, possibly twin sons, of Adam and Eve. So this is right after God has ejected Adam and Eve out of the garden. Um, obviously, they're grown because they are, they are farming and they are herding um, livestock. And so we come to the scene where they both come with an offering for God. And one is acceptable to God and the other isn't. So we just want to look at the idea of, of what this giving is. What can we understand about giving in our life of obedience to Christ through this story? The first thing I think that we have to notice is that this is a responsive act. Giving is a responsive act. That's what makes it worship at its heart. You see, this is a response to God's good creation. 
God in Genesis 1 creates everything, the heaven and the earth and everything that is in them. He, he makes plants, he makes animals, he establishes the air, the sun and the moon. He um, controls the water, sets limits to it. Um, everything is, is arranged, is ordered in his good creation in order for life, the blessing of life to flourish in this creation. That is not just for the animal life, but particularly for human life. Adam and Eve, that human couple, are forebearers. God made this whole creation with us in mind so that um, we would flourish as his creatures. And so, uh, even though they've been ejected from the garden, that continues. So, this worship that Cain and Abel do is a natural, responsive act to what God has done in creation. He has given humanity an abundance. Everything they need is there. And in fact, in the Garden of Eden, they didn't even have to work for it. Food produced by itself. The plants were watered by itself. There was, there was labor of the man and the woman, but that was, that was joyful. It wasn't, um, it wasn't toiled, to use another biblical word. And so humanity, recognizing this, blessing of life and abundance that God has given to us, the first thing we do then when we recognize that is to respond, to say thank you to God, um, recognizing that this world that he has given to us, he has set us over, has an abundance. And so this should cultivate in us a, a worshipful um, attitude. And notice there's no commandment on Cain and Abel to, to give. They do this of their own volition. And even though Cain and Abel are outside of the garden, and even though um, they now have to toil, so uh, Abel, uh, I think it's Abel, works in the soil, and no, Cain works in the soil, and Abel works with um, livestock, they still have to work, so they, they have to sweat. But they recognize that God has not cut them off totally. He still has provided all the means of their life. They just have to work for it now. They have to be co-laborers with God in order to survive. But the earth still produces food, and livestock still produces milk and meat and other things that they need for life. And these are still God's blessings to them. And so worship is this responsive act that you and I have. We sometimes fool ourselves to thinking that we have worked for everything that we need. And sometimes we give to God grudgingly because we have that kind of a mindset. Well, I'm the one who had to get up early in the morning, and I'm the one who had to go to that job, and I'm the one who had to put in the hours. The reality is, if we were to look at it in a fair and honest way, we do not provide for ourselves. All these gifts are still the good gifts of God. All of it is predicated on God's abundant blessing and giving to us. And so that's the second thing that we need to recognize coming out of this story is that our giving is not just a, an attitude of gratitude, but also acknowledges that dependence on God, that our lives are 100% dependent on God and out of that expresses that gratitude. So notice that um, Cain and Abel are not able to make these things happen. Sure, they can um, till the soil and plant things, but ultimately, if it wasn't for God's order of creation, nothing would grow. If it wasn't for the breath of life in the, in the animals, they would not live. Everything that humanity has is dependent on God. And so, part of giving means that Left to ourselves, we have nothing to give. We have nothing to offer. So there's a little bit of an irony here. We offer back to God what he has given to us because that's the only thing that we have to give. 
And so that deepens our gratitude and that exercise in itself of, of thinking about everything truly belonging to God, everything being given to us, and taking a portion of that away, kind of like my earlier attitudes that thought, if I give a part of this money away, I will have less for the things that I want and maybe for the things that I need. So it becomes this faithful trust act in God to give back a part of what it is that he has given to us. And of course, the other thing that the story tells us is that our giving is a heart attitude, not just a hand attitude. We can easily give God grudgingly, but that is not the kind of giving that he is looking for. The giving that we see from Cain and Abel is a heart thing. And so when we come to the text we have to ask the question, why is it that Cain's was unacceptable, but Abel's was? And the difference seems to be in the description of the offering. So for Abel, the text says that he brought some of the first fruits to the Lord, whereas Abel brought an offering fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And it seems to be a difference in quality. Cain seems to be offering, but maybe offering what is not the best. Maybe it's coming out of a, a grudging attitude about um, giving. Maybe this is just a tokenism. Keep God happy. Keep God off of their backs. Whereas Abel seems to be thinking about how could he give his best what can he do that is going to demonstrate the gratitude and honor that he understands God deserves because of the abundance that God had given? And so there seems to be a difference in the givers, which lead to a, a difference in the gift, in the offering. And so when we think about giving... We need to acknowledge that our lives depend on God, and we need to express that gratitude, but joyfully, with an open and thankful heart, recognizing that even this that we give is itself coming from God. Well, of course, if we are honest with ourselves, that no matter what, we probably cannot escape the problem of Cain. If we are really honest with ourselves, we seem to have a limited or finite amount. And we want to hang on to it. And so, so often, when we give, we do it with some measure of a double heart, both a desire to give and a desire not to give. That was Cain's problem. And that's our problem too. And of course, if our giving is what is going to qualify us for salvation or to be a part of God's people, then we're in trouble. We, like Cain, have sin crouching at our door looking to devour us. And like Cain, we have not been able to tame that. But here's the good news of the gospel, particularly when we are thinking about the issue of giving. That Christ has taken our place as giver and as offering. Christ has offered on our behalf an acceptable offering to God. As I said earlier, in Christ's life and death, he has been obedient to God, offering everything. The first fruits, the choicest, fattest, that is what he has done when he has laid down his life. And so we continue to give joyfully and of our best as Christians, but now without the fear of condemnation, because it's not our offering to God that God is considering. No, Christ has stood in our place, in the place of humanity, and he has given the 
acceptable offering to God on our behalf. And so now, by faith, as it says in Hebrews 11, we too offer our offering in Christ. And so our offering is offered by Christ as our high priest. And because of his offering, our offering is acceptable. Giving. It is a, a difficult topic to talk about because it, it is so visceral when we talk about our money. A, a, a sermon series on giving can really sideline us, can make us think, oh no, I don't want to sit through another one of those. I think though a sermon on giving, I hope, should excite us and please us rather than stress us out. Because what this should be is simply a reminder that God, our Father, has given us all things in Christ Jesus. And because of that, our true heartfelt response should be gratitude that is simply faithfully saying thank you to the one who has given all for us. Well, let's pray. Father, we, we recognize that maybe in our head we can say, yes, you, God, have created all things and are the source of all things. And that apart from you, we can do nothing, not even provide for ourselves or our families. That we really are dependent on you for our life. But that doesn't change the fact that we are also a part of this world. A world that has taught us and formed us to always think that we don't have enough. That the things that we do have are not good enough and are in need of replacing. In short, Lord, that we often think out of a place of scarcity. And as a result, when it comes to the topic of giving, we simply think about it as a religious duty. That more often than not, we think, how little can we give and still be okay? Lord, we pray that you would change our heart attitude. We pray that you would help us to see Christ and to be like Christ, who was obedient even to death, who gave everything to you and for you. And so, Lord, help us to think about what it means for us to cheerfully and thankfully, with gratitude, give to you what it is that you have given to us in obedience and with joy. And help us to understand that as being contributed to or added to what Christ has done. Christ and his sacrifice is sufficient and is the only acceptable offering. And so let this be an additional joy, Lord, as we give to you through him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we're going to have Jeremy sing our closing song, Take My Life. Congregation, please join me in a song of response. Take my voice. 
Thank you, Jeremy. Well, here's this benediction. Oh, the depth and the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us this week. Uh, we look forward to hanging out in our Google Hangout for the last time this week, because next week we are going to be gathering in person, and we look forward to doing that with you. Have a good week, and God bless.